Okay, everybody, welcome back to part two of our The Process videos series. Basically, we're talking about the, uh, the setup process, how you go from a baseline setup down into uh, something that's drivable, something you can have fun with, and uh, where to go from there. So today, we're going to start going to uh, we're going to start going into some little more more detailed things. Uh, we're going to get a little more in depth whenever it comes to uh, some of the more detailed garage settings. Um, so let's let's do some stuff from a little recap from Monday. Uh, essentially, we started with the low down force settings. Um, the load I racing's low down force um, fix set for the uh, C7 Corvette, and what we had was is uh, exceptionally low, the lowest you can get, cold tire pressures, and um, just a basic spring package that was in there. And uh, I kind of my thought process whenever I was explaining the uh, where to start for your initial spring packages for a car kind of pulled a Thelma and Louise there and uh, kind of went off on the on a little bit of a mini tangent and uh, lost a train of thought but what it all came down to when we, and later on in the video um, I, I basically got to the the stuff that I wanted to show you guys of how you can manipulate the springs in regards to ride heights and how you can um, utilize the springs to, to change the balance of the car and the dynamic weight balance and the dynamic weight transfer of the car. Um, so, no, we don't want to save that. That one sucks. So let's go to what we finished up with last week, or uh, last Monday, with the version 2 of our little test. Um, so, there's that. Here's one other thing that... Uh, that I wanted to come back to and revisit because, like I said, I'm kind of new to streaming and uh, I didn't realize I was explaining it and I was using the mouse pointer um, on the OBS window that was open and not realizing that the mouse pointer was not active on you guys' screen. Um, so we're going to do it like this. Okay. A real quick recap of the the correlation between the center of gravity, dynamic weight transfer, and ride heights as it comes down to as in a system of the car. Um, so hopefully you can definitely see my pointer now. Let me double check this. All right, awesome. Let me double check the stream here so we're good. And let's come back to the simulator and pull that back up. Okay, awesome. Um, so, 
one of the things that, that I wanted to point out first uh, that I actually forgot was a thing called sprung weight. Um, you have unsprung weight in a in a any car. You have unsprung weight. You have sprung weight, and then there's the dogs. I told you we have a herd. Um, sprung weight, unsprung weight. Uh, let me close the door. Copper's gonna be pissed because he's my little sidekick. As some of you may know, if you've tuned in before, um, sprung weight, unsprung weight, and um, something called like semi-sprung weight. I'm sure there's a more technical term for it, but we're not gonna um, bother ourselves with that. So, most cars, except for some old experimental F1 cars, most cars have two axles, the front axle and the back axle, okay? And this diagram pretty much explains uh, how those axles work together and the chassis of the car works together, and it, it, uh, it lays out some of the forces that are involved in a race car. So, um, here you see the tire. That is the front axle. Rear tire, rear axle, okay? Um, so, real quick, general description of unsprung weight. Unsprung weight is anything that is directly attached to this axle that is not supported by the springs of the car. Um, so, real quick, like your tires, your spindles, their rims, the... Uh, brake calipers uh, in the back of the car if it's a if it's a solid um, rear axle that rear axles for the most part unsprung weight and then you can get into different stuff uh, for semi sprung weight like uh, control arms and, and different things like that but in the grand scheme of i racing and i racing setups you really it's n really near the, neither here nor there the only thing that you're really concerned about is what we call the sprung weight and the sprung weight is essentially, as I just said, anything supported on the springs. So the frame, and then anything attached to the frame, motors, transmission, um, say like uh, the driver's seat, uh, the body of the car, all that stuff is sprung weight, okay? And uh, so that, you can see these squiggly lines here are denoted by the springs and that line there is essentially the uh, the sprung weight of the chassis on that particular axle okay and then it's the same thing for the back alright so uh, one of the things that I wanted to see show you this for is because with both axles and I said this yesterday you want the car to roll at the same Rate. You want it to roll the, the same in the front as you as it does in the back. You don't want the front trying to pull the back over, and you don't want the back pulling the front over as it as it two halves of the car rolls over. So you want them rolling over like that. You don't want the back rolling over first, that which pulls the front over. You don't want the front pull run rolling over first, that pulls the back over. You don't want any of that. Um, a, a dynamically balanced race car the front and rear halves of the car work together. And uh, one of the things that uh, that you can see here is torque. Um, so this spring-looking thing, this coil, represents the torque that is present in the chassis. So the C stands for chassis, the TOR um, so is torque, so chassis sub-torque. Um, and what we are talking about in regards to ride heights goes is that how the springs and everything are connected to the to the chassis is you can select the the ride height um, using in this car push rods and the Indy car is push rods. Um, I believe the F1 car is also push rods. But um, you can do spring perches for for other types of cars like NASCAR and things like that. But the general rule is you want the the sprung weight of the vehicle to be as low as possible. So um, that symbol right here, that circle with the uh, the black and white in there, that is the uh, pretty much the symbol for center of gravity, um, which is all of the weight that is 
acting on that axle. And then this height of it, this bar that sticks straight up, is how high the cumulative weight on that axle is above, um, essentially above the ground or above where the, uh, the chassis mounts to the springs or the, yeah, for the most part. So bottom line is the lower that is, the less chassis roll that you're going to have, say like in a left-hand turn, the less chassis roll that you're going to have to the, to the right side of the vehicle, which means the less weight that that tire has. So the less weight that that tire has, the more the inside tires of the corner um, are going to help bear the load. So um, let's just say the amount of grip that you have, you want the, the inside tires to, to maintain as much possible weight on them as possible so you can have as much grip on those tires as, as you possibly can. And um, you're never, they're never going to be equal. You just can't, you really can't do that. It's impossible. Um, so what you want to do is you, you want to minimize the height of the center of gravity to, to maximize as much as possible the, uh, the weight being exerted on the inside tire in the turn. Um, and so what we were talking about before is uh, the right heights in the front and in the back and how much weight you're going to put. So um, but in each each one. And the right height in the back is what we we're talking about is if the front rolls over at a certain amount and you have a certain amount of weight in, in front being pulled over, um, that's affected by how high it is. So if just it real simply like it's a multiplier. So if you have 1,000 pounds up front on this front axle and you're going around a turn at say three G's, that's 3,000 pounds trying to be thrown over to the to the outside of the car. Okay, great. Now, 3,000 or 1,000 pounds up front, I mean, that's if you have a uh, forward uh, mounted engine, a front mounted engine in the car, um, that that ballast up there is, is going to add to the weight along that axle and you're going to be throwing it over to the side there. But um, in in the rear of, a, of a, the car with an engine in the front, you're not going to have a lot of weight back here. You're not going to have, um, say, a thousand pounds of weight in the back of the car. You may have 600. You may have 500 or something like that. So, if these heights are equal, and we have a thousand pounds up front being thrown over 3 G's. That's 3,000 pounds. But if you only have 500 pounds in the back being thrown over at 3 G's, well, that's only 1,500 pounds. So what do you do? Um, you start raising the rear ride height. Okay, and you start making that variable larger, so the higher that it is, the more that it, it throws over. Okay, so when we were talking yesterday about GT3 cars that have very limited spring package combinations that you can possibly find, that the, the balance of power limits the cars to, um, one of the ways that you can get the rear of the car to, to roll over more to match the front roll of the car is is right height. So that's that's how that works. And I kind of wanted to come back and visit that because I was giving you all these terms and I didn't realize that the pointer was not on your screen. So there's that. Um, so that's good. We can get rid of that. All right. So what did we do yesterday? Um, we started looking at the the tire pressures. And those were 22. I don't know how they got back down to 21, but they were 22. Um, I do believe we even went up to 24. I may not have saved this from yesterday. Okay, so I, we went to 22 pounds, and it was a night and day difference. Um, so we went up another 2 pounds of pressure on the tires. Okay, so that, that helped out more, but not as much as the initial increase in cold tire pressures helped. So you can tell that we were getting close to the ballpark of the peak um, or the optimal hot tire pressures. Okay. And um, we looked at the aerodynamics and we said we're going to keep it like this until we actually get a car that we can drive. And then whenever we came down to the aero calculator, and I'm probably going to have to email iRacing and get the story on this, but um, it looks at the, the ride heights 
um, of the of the car from telemetry, and you can't get the ride height high enough um, in the back for it to actually work. Um, or was it low enough? I forget. I have to go back and double check it. But uh, it it was almost impossible to get that the front. Um, correct. I think that was it. Yeah, it was the front because it only goes to 1.575 and we were like at 1.8 or something like that. We have to go back and double check it. Um, but like I said, this is uh, the right height up front and it's not the... It would make sense if it was the, the splitter height, but it's not. Um, at least as compared to all the other cars that I've, that I've ever worked on that actually has an aero calculator. Uh, so... We're going to go and we're going to keep this as low as possible because remember how I said uh, whenever I start something up, I like to start from one end of the spectrum. So what I know right now is that, A, this is the least amount of downforce on the car, which is what I like to set the car up with um, so I can maximize the mechanical grip out of the suspension. And then we'll start dialing in aerodynamics. We'll start dialing in downforce, and we're going to move – the aerodynamic center of pressure from as far back as it could possibly go here with this the aerodynamic settings we have and if this is the center of gravity in the car if you look at think about that diagram I just showed you you had the center of gravity in the front you had the center of gravity in the back you average those out and then you will get where it is in the middle of the car so 45 percent 48 percent or something along those lines um, that's where the center of gravity of the overall vehicle weight sits. So you want the aerodynamic center of the car, or the center of pressure, one of the two, whichever one you want to use. Uh, temperature, uh, Terminology-wise, they're pretty much the same. You want that behind the center of gravity at all times, because if the aerodynamic center goes to the front of the center of gravity, the car becomes massively aerodynamically unstable, and it wants to swap ends, just aerodynamic-wise. So... What we're going to do is going to keep the aerodynamics as, as low as possible, and which results in a center of pressure as far back as possible. Awesome. And then we also had um, the uh, – did I load up the right setup? Let me double check, make sure I did the right setup. Because I thought there was one in here. To oh, there it is. That's the one. Okay, SM. Crap. I may have just screwed up. Oops. Uh, forget it. So, it's going to be the same as what we had before. I think we're 1150, 1150, 1100, and uh, 8. I get into talking, and then... Six. So if I remember correctly, it's yeah, eight six eight six. We'll put the uh, fifty fifty dampers back in. So nine, eight six, eight six. Cool. Okay, so that's pretty much where we started out yesterday, except. Zero toe up in the front. Actually, no, we dialed in some toe in the front, as a matter of fact. Um, that was how that all was. I believe we had the medium, threes, and then we had one sixteenth in the back, and it was that. Okay, so we're back on track as far as that goes. And uh, yep, we're about as low in the front as we could possibly go with that. And. We saw that in the car, it actually resulted in um, the uh, the ride heights in the front splitter not getting sealed to the ground enough. So that's why we went from uh, 1,150 springs down to maybe if we even went down to 1050, as a matter of fact. So there we go. And then 1.616, and then we s remember we dial in a half an inch of rake, which is where we start, because you need some. 
we'll do that. There we go. All right. So there's that. And then I remember I told you that the uh, we were two. We went four. And I think we were back down here at 25 is where we were at the preload. And then we had to add a little bit more in there. And then the drive angle was it about, uh, I believe we were at 70. And that was at 40. And what we were doing was we were increasing the uh, clutch differential. So I'm going to save this right now so I don't screw it up again. And uh, so there's that. All right, so we're back to where we started again. So the fundamentals, tire pressures we got, aerodynamics, we figured out. Basic spring rate we have. We have our 50-50 shots, shocks um, in there, and which is going to make adjusting the shocks easier due to the histogram. And we're going to get to that in a second. And... Uh, we got our gear set as close as we can for now, and then we have the differential set. Okay, so let's go back out, and we're going to do some some hot laps, and we're going to see um, exactly where we are with the car again, and we're going to get another uh, telemetry run in, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to start looking and seeing uh, what we got going on. And... Uh, if you guys don't know, like iRacing in this latest update gave us all this neat G Wiz stuff that has to do with all of your your computer um, performance issues, the uh, uh, server issues, your connection issues, your latency, your quality, and then all of this has to do with your GPU and CPU, if I'm not mistaken, as well as that up there, and then this down here is your force feedback. So. Uh, let's go out and turn some laps. And as I said on Monday, this isn't uh, a track guide, so my line is not going to be optimal or probably even close to being correct because what I'm doing right now is I'm just trying to get a setup comfortable enough and so I could get enough performance out of the car so then I can start working on, the, uh, on my lines and things like that. So I was kind of not... I was second guessing the the selection of this car for this tutorial, but it actually worked out perfect because I haven't driven it in so long that it would just be like a new user coming in to a new car with a no setup at all and coming in and doing this from scratch, which is pretty much exactly what I wanted this tutorial to be about. So everything works out. Oh, there's another thing, and if you're a new subscriber, um, you may see, although it may be covered up by my actual camera, um, I've been having some issues with my Fanatec pedals with the electronics where I'm 100% throttle, and it just cuts from 100% throttle back down to 50% or 20% or something like that so I have to wiggle the throttle at all so if you see me lifting during a straightaway I'm not lifting on purpose that has a it's an electrical issue with the 
with the hardware. I tried calling Fanatec about it and went through hoops and hoops and hoops and it was just easier just to grab a buddy's uh, electronics in the car that he wasn't using. Um, the electronics in the, in the set of pedals that he wasn't using. And uh, he was a really nice dude and he gave them to me. The electronics from his V2 pedals. So... Still a lot of instability under braking. Which is, which is okay, I mean, at this point in the setup process, it's not horrific, but it's not great, so. Let's dial in some front brake. And then learn how to drive the car again. So we're going to do this lap, and we're going to do another lap, uh, just to get the tires um, temperatures back down because we did that four-wheel slide. Missed a shift. Maybe we'll do two more laps. What I like to do as well is I like to look out the back of the car and see if there's any sparks. If you see sparks, you know something's dragging. But uh, like we said yesterday, we got pretty much the, the right heights roughed into the point where not much is dragging. So if you remember yesterday, I believe we were starting out somewhere in the 44 second range, one minute, 44 seconds and, and change. We're down to 142.6. And like I said, the car feels much, much better. Another reason why the car may be unstable during braking is is uh, higher than necessary cambers. But that's going to be something that we're going to have to look at in telemetry. Drop the wheel. Awesome. Okay. Well, let's just go see what we got. We had enough halfway decent laps, so we should be able to go and see what we got going on. 
So let's look here at the uh, tire pressures. So they're up into the 29s and even in the 30s in the back. But the 30, that spike back there is from the accident. All righty. So let's come out and look at a little bit of telemetry from that run and see where we are. Let me bring over telemetry over into this channel or to this screen where everybody can see it. If you're doing telemetry and it's starting to take forever to load your data, um, go into your My Documents and the telemetry um, output from iRacing and start deleting stuff because it keeps everything. So like if you have, like me, your telemetry set to come on automatically um, through uh, Mu, which is, I'll explain later, um, the, out the data that iRacing outputs, the telemetry data, is not in a format that MoTeC can read. So some awesome person uh, uh, who was massively smarter than most of us made a program to translate everything into a format that MoTeC can run. And one in that program, you can set it to automatically start telemetry every time you go into a session. So it's really, really helpful if you're forgetful like I am. Um, so let's look at some of this. So first things first, we'll come back to the, to that, um, the differential. Because instability under braking and turn in, it, the differential has a lot of influence in that too. Um, so if you guys have been here uh, for the last couple uh, live streams when I talk about setups, setups is like a circle. It's a circular uh, process where you go through everything once, optimize it as best as you can, start looking at different things again, um, all the different variables in the circle again, things that you can optimize again, and then as you get them optimized, uh, you get you can check that one off, and then you can skip it the next time. And there's an order in, in which all these variables are set around the, uh, the process circle, if you want to call it that, and the, the fundamental stuff is way up front, and then the more detailed stuff is, is further along the back um, end of the circle. So as you get the fundamental stuff squared away, you can just skip over that process and you can skip to some of the more detailed stuff. And um, so we're still almost to the end of the, uh, the fundamental aspects of the, of the setup process. So let's come in and take a look at... This is a really good one right here. Coming into turn one, and you can see the, uh, the left side tires are, are starting to skid and everything like that. And um, you can see the... Where's the... Uh, oh, there it is. Um, the right side tires, which are the low-bearing tires, because it's a left-hand turn, so the right side tires. And then these surface temperatures is what telemetry reads, which is different than the core temperatures that you see in the garage, um, or the carcass temperatures that you see in the garage. And you can see that there's a pretty decent split here. Um, probably a little more than, than what I would like to see. Um, I know some people like very, very aggressive cambers, and I was just talking to somebody on Facebook about this going back and forth, about why low tire pressures seem to be faster. And one of the reasons that I can think of off the top of my head is, is if you're using very aggressive cambers, if you deflate the tire, you increase the contact patch. Um, because when you deflate the tire, it goes like that, and then the actual contact patch, instead of it being like that because of this massive camber, now you're deflating the tire, and the contact patch starts to come back down and more um, compliant with the road. So uh, I... I like I said, if, if that's what people like to run, that's perfectly fine. I mean, knock yourselves out. But in my personal opinion, it is not an accurate way of doing it. It's uh, it's kind of like a, a strange, uh, how do I want to put it? 
Um, it, it, it's an exploitation of the of the tire model, which is the exact same thing like the oval races are doing, like I've mentioned a couple times before. They've thrown as much camber as possible because you can't blow the tire up from abuse, and then you go out and run it. Um, whereas in the real world, ma a, a large camber and soft tires, underinflated tires, equals your tire coming apart. So, uh, like I said, hopefully new tire model 7. Please, iRacing Gods, make it work. So, all right, enough rambling. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at that, uh, the uh, cameras for, for that, and let's come take a look at the ride heights. Okay. So as you can see, the front and rear ride heights, we're starting to get pretty low now um, through some of the high-speed corner so like through turns one and two of the oval <clears throat> you're starting to get pretty low quarter of an inch off the ground and then through three and four you're about a half an inch off the ground maybe a little less if you average everything out so um, there's still a little bit to go we can look at the dynamic weight evaluation and we can see um, where stuff is as far as the dynamic weight transfer and what spring package we have because um, like you saw we're out of adjustment with the uh, push rods we actually can't drop the ride height anymore statically in the garage so now we're gonna have to fudge it with um, springs the the front springs so right at the end of Monday's tutorial I was saying that we made a spring change and it was kind of uh, a kill three birds with one stone kind of is uh, issue. And this is kind of strange. For some weird reason, my left rear dynamic loading seems to be off. So I may have input something a little inaccurately in um, the maths section of the uh, telemetry uh, project workbook. But so let's go look at, at this where it's, it's the right side tires. And we're going to look at turn one. And we're going to see how this looks down in through the important part. So you can see the front, right front is a lot more than the right rear. And we can do this. We can make sure that, that MoTeC is looking at, I have inputted the correct spring rates in my MoTeC calculations. Um, so let's do that. Like I said, that's going to be off screen because it's super secret. Yeah, and I did. Um, super secret double probation. You're not allowed to look at it. Um, and I did have the wrong value inputted for the left rear um, spring rate. Okay, so there we go. Now we're now we're cooking with gas. So as you can see, coming in through here, we're still pretty heavy on the front and not really heavy on the back. So um, we still need softer up front, which is going to bring that number down, and we need a little more in the back uh, to bring that number up. So that'll be the next iteration of our update to the to the setup. So, speaking of instability, on entry, all of these flags down here that are generated by um, a formula that we make, which is triggered by the difference in tire speeds, rear tire speeds, the left rear versus the right rear, um, if they're outside of the sensitivity that we set, or that I set in the, in the telemetry, background then it will throw a flag and this flag is just for an arbitrary value 30 <coughs> excuse me um, so it looks like on entry we have a lot of issues it's, you know there there's you see the turn one entry issue a pretty big issue going into the hairpin and then a lot going through the infield there so we got those three things 
let's go back to iRacing and start fixing them. Going to come down another 50 pounds. Reset some ride heights here. And then we're going to come up in the back to 1200. 107 was what that was. There. Um, yeah. Auto adjustment in front for that. So what else we're going to do is, is we're going to start taking away a little more camber. And we're getting pretty low. And this is going to change the ride heights. That didn't change them that much. We're pretty we're already pretty flat as far as ride heights go. So that's good. Um and we're gonna do the same for the back. And people are gonna be like, I can't believe you're using that low of camber. It's like, hey, telemetry don't lie. Um a lot of people use camber by feel. A lot of guys or drivers I should say. You know, it's girls drivers too. Um when I say guys, all right, don't don't message me like, you know, you're a sexist jerk. No, I'm not a sexist jerk. I say guys, and I mean everybody, a collective group of people, just like y'all, just like folks. So, all right, so we're going to do that. And then uh, we're going to come back here again, and we're going to look at the same thing here. We are pretty much out of adjustment. When it comes to, we're already at the low end of the uh, the differential, the coast ramp angle. Um, so we're not getting enough locking uh, force out of the differential under turn in. So, and because um, if you haven't uh, been around, um, the lower these two numbers go, the more locking force there is. Okay, so. 30 is the lowest it can go, 40. Um, so the low numbers on the coast, on corner entry, equates to more stability. And less locking force under throttle or drive uh, ramp angles, less force ha is more stable. So um, we're at both ends, and we still have room to come down on the drive ramp angle. Um, to initiate some locking because you saw that there was some flags being thrown um, in the differential telemetry. But that's not going to help us because we can't do really anything more with the coast ramp angle. So if we're going to come up here to the, the clutch plates, or as it's called in this particular car, clutch friction faces. Um, real quick review. Um, each clutch plate has two faces, a front and a back. So that's what I'm going to guess that this means. So just divide that by two, that number by two, and that's how many clutch plates are in there. So right there, that's three clutch plates, two clutch plates, one clutch plate. And then four, five, and six, which is a lot. So let's go back down to six. And the amount of clutch plates that you have in the differential multiplies the locking force of all of these settings, okay? Um, so like we said, um, we're at the bottom of that force, okay, um, and we can really can't go any lower, so we have to multiply the force that 40 degrees generates by increasing the amount of clutch plates. So we're going to do that too. All right, so I'm not going to save it because it may be junk. So when you get something really good that you've made a lot of progress with, save it and then do another set of adjustments. And later on in the process, after you get this all roughed in, you want to do one thing at a time, not shotgun three or four adjustments at the car because you're not going to know which one did which, which adjustment made the improvement and which one may not have. Or you could have had one adjustment make this massive improvement and then one adjustment really screw it up and then you just meet in the middle. Um, so, but where we are now in the setup is there's enough things wrong that we can make um, a, a good assertion of 
all three of these adjustments are going to put the car in a much better um, state. So, all right. So we're going to try and eliminate all that stuff. So back to iRacing, and I'm going to go back to full screen. And uh, I saw also on the on the live stream I was reviewing from Monday that uh, it seems like the resolution changes a little bit whenever I switch from full screen to windowed mode. So hopefully it's all turns out to where you can see it and it's clear and everything like that. So Nectar of the Gods. Thank you, Caffeine. All right, back on track. Yeah, as you guys can see, we're setting green sector times, which means we've made some improvements. Let me explain something else, especially for you oval dudes and dudettes. You see how I hit the, the apron there? All right. If you have really screwed up camber angles, that upsets the car so much more in oval track racing than it is if you had human, uh, I should say, <laughs> not human, but more... Uh, conventional camber settings. And this nose of this car still likes to freaking just dart in one direction or another under braking, so I'm not thinking that that's differential as of yet, but because we're not seeing it in telemetry. But what we may have done yesterday is I think we made a, can a caster adjustment. And I loaded up the, uh, the wrong setup, believe it or not, whenever I just came in here. So those caster settings may be back to off, being off. So we're going to go back and look at this because caster settings can have that kind of uh, impact on corner entry as far as instability goes. We're still getting too much instability on entry. That's that just isn't right. Huh. Okay. So let's go in here and let's let's try and change this up a little bit. So everything is connected. Let's go to seven and a half. And then make sure we get everything back to normal. So one one. We have to massage all this back into 
compliance and what you want. All right. If I'm not mistaken, we have to put these back down, and there you go. Okay. There you go. All right. So, a little adjustment on the caster there. And let's see how that works. Corner entry is crucial. Because if your entry is screwed up, the rest of the corner is going to be screwed up. And there's really not a whole heck of a lot you can do about it except stop the car and slow down massively. to just get the car back under control again, so. Yep, that's what that adjustment was yesterday that we did, because the car feels better so far, so let's see if that holds up. So, so, so far, we made good improvements to the car. We're all green sectors, even though you guys can't see it. It's uh, covered by the camera. And for this lap, unless I screw up the bus stop, it'll be a pretty good lap. I screwed up the bus stop. Good God, you got wheel damage. All right. We're still having issues with that instability on turn in. So what's the lowest you can go here? 7.5. So we're pretty much down to, to where that should be. Um, I don't want to go any lower because then you're at one end of the spectrum. What we're going to do. Oh. I didn't check, double check the toe before I pulled back on track, and it was at a positive 1 16th. Well, that could be a big issue, too. So what we're going to do is we're going to dial in a little bit of front, a negative front toe, a little bit of toe out. And that should also help with the stability on entry. And something else we're going to do is I'm going to bump up this preload. 
a little bit as as well because sometimes telemetry depending on what I have it set at in the background as far as all the calculations go might not be optimal for the track that I'm running so instead of sitting here boring you going through all of the formulas and stuff like that I'm just going to take a guess and we're going to up the preload um, on the differential now preload does have a lot um, of influence on the initial application of the brakes going from um, full th wide open throttle to max braking that's where your preload kind of does a lot of work um, because like I, I was saying before um, the drive the the preload adjusts how much force is already present inside the inside the differential whenever the the splines of the of the gears in the differential go from driving the car forward to trying to slow it down um, so that adjusts or I should say that tunes that transition so um, something else that I saw and like I said this setup was from a different um, I believe it was at night time I think it was from the 24 hour um, one of the 24 hours we did and first gear is just a tad too boggy it's a it's a little too tall so we need to, I'm gonna shorten that up a little bit and um, we may also shorten up through the the middle portion of these as well um, just a little bit because we're working daytime now and now we're working at night so all right so let's fool around with this differential a little more and do a couple more runs so you see how we went from we're starting to inject more of the more detailed tuning options into this process So we're going to do this run of about three laps, barring I don't screw it up, and then we're going to go and we're going to look at ride heights again. So already again you can see that we're making progress um, more green sections even though my exit out of that out of the infield wasn't all that stellar um, you can see through the middle that we were making a little bit of progress so so the preload help so far um, the toe out helped a little so far um, because they're towing the, the tires out does help the car cut into the corner um, but you only want a little bit of help you can go too far to the point where the car is just you're introducing a lot of rolling drag and you don't want to do that either I keep hitting those tires Those tires right there. I've improved entry again, the same as yesterday, where I hit trying at the same marks as I as I was with an ill handling car and a good handling car, just screws everything up. And again, if you're new, I cannot talk and drive at the same time. I can on straights, but any technical um, influence that, that needs to be put on the car. I cannot talk and do that at the same time.
Down a little more front brake just to see what happens. So we're going to bring it in this time, and uh, we're going to look at the differential one more time, and we're going to look at the uh, the dynamic weight transfer one more time, and then we're going to work on the, the dampers. Because right now it looks like what we've done so far is about as good as we're going to get with the foundation foundational stuff. So the next step in line is the timing of the dynamic weight transfer and that falls on the dampers or the shocks. Uh, the shocks are a timing device. Okay, so here we are. That isn't bad, so we're going to save that. Alrighty. So, let's exit out of this full screen mode. Let's go look at some OTEC one more time, and then make some last fundamental changes to the vehicle and then we're going to start looking at dampers and I believe after we do a couple runs with dampers that'll probably be about it for today um, see we're getting a little bit better here with the, dam or with the transmission and let's take a peek at the suspension You can see the front right height is starting to come down a little, little less than the rear was. So we have room to come down on the rear of the car. And uh, believe it or not, that actually has a significant amount of impact on the aerodynamic center of the car. Um, you can watch it here. And you can see as you increase the rear right height, the front downforce percentage or the center of pressure 
moves forward. Okay, so rake has a lot to do with with that as well. And so let's come back and lower this ride height just a tad. Um, I think one of the big things that happened was um, we increased the spring rates in the back, which actually was holding the car up a little more. So we can actually come down on our front right or our right height split or rake and see how that works. Um, and remember, we haven't even come close to, to dialing in some arrow. So the car is unstable as it is, especially the rear end. We also don't have any aerodynamics um, helping us as far as the rear of the car goes. So that's why I like to say maximize the mechanical grip of the car and then go work on arrow. That's the reason for that. Okay, so let's go to chassis. Let's bring up MoTeC. All right, so we, we kind of addressed that by lowering the the uh, rear ride heights because when these two are different and the car's going through the air like that, it's working like a wedge. It's not as streamlined as it should, so you want the, the ride height to be equal so it streamlines through the air a little better. But um, here we are at the, su the suspension, or I should say the, uh, the shock histogram. And what you can see here is the low speed in the gray. Well, let me start off by saying what this actually does if you weren't here for some of the other tutorials. The shock histogram is a visual depiction of how fast um, the shock is traveling in and out, either compression or in rebound, how fast it's moving, and then it groups that into um, how much time it spends in each state. So you can see on here the low speed uh, velocity measurements, how much time it spends in the low speed um, transition, how fast the shocks are moving in and out, uh, versus the high velocity of the shocks. Now, what the hell does that mean? Okay. Th anything in the gray area, low speed is um, transitions in motion as far as left turns, right turns, acceleration, braking, stuff that happens at a relatively slow speed in relation to the overall potential velocity of the shock moving in and out. The high s velocity is bumps, you know, um, it would be really important if this was on the 2007 version of Daytona, which is really, really bumpy. Um, so the low speed has to do with the timing of the dynamic weight transfer, and the high speed has to do with tire compliance as it bounces over um, rough road, okay, or rough par portions of the track. Um, so that's what you're looking at here. So anything in the gray has to do with dynamic weight transitions from left to right, front to back. Anything in the white has to do with um, high speed velocity of the shock or bumps. Uh, maybe you hit a curb or something along those lines. So with all that nice background information, using this is very, very simple. You essentially want, if you see this left rear shock, see how it's balanced. It's almost, it looks like a little mountain that is exactly what you want. So as we're looking at these, the rear shocks look pretty darn good. And you want them within 1%. Um, identical is ideal, but you're never going to get it. Um, and then the high speed, we're within about 1%. So let's go to a shock that's really out of whack, the left front. Um, the left front's going to be out of whack a lot simply because um, there's a lot of high speed corners that are left-hand turns, you know, um, say coming in through through turn one and then exiting the infield, you know, those are those are left turns, which means the inside of the, the tire that isn't loaded as much as the left side tire. So um, you really want to get that optimized because it's not working hard as it is. So 
you want to get as much out of it as you possibly can. So you want to you want to tune that. And then the the right front looks a little out of whack too. So what what you do here is is you look at these numbers. You start with the low speed first. Okay, so let's start with the right front. 27% versus 24%. Okay? So you ask yourself this, how is the car acting on entry? When you come into the corner and you turn the wheel, all the weights can be shifted to the front of the car. What's it doing? Is it darty? Is it uh, uh, going into the? Is it cutting into the corner too fast? If the answer is yes, then that means that that uh, you need a little more stiffer front shock to soften that transition up a little more. So that's what we're going to do first. Okay, so let's come over into here. Low speed compression damping. Higher numbers equate to more damping, which means more resistance in a direction of motion. So low speed compression damping means in the compression stroke, which is down or in or squeezing, um, the resistance will be more the higher that number is. So um, a zero may do that. A 10 or whatever maximum that is, I think it's uh, 16, it'll be like that, okay? So that's that's the difference, 0, 16, okay? So we're going to do that first. So we're going to go from 8 to, let's do, yeah, let's just stay there at 10. So that's the front, um, low speed stuff. So that's what we're going to try and increase because it's going to, when you slow it down, it's going to spend more time in low speed compression. So you want to increase that, that number. So that's percentage of overall time of in or out. Um, so 24% of the time it is low speed compression. Awesome. Um, and then you can just do the high speed stuff too. And it's actually pretty close. It's pretty close. Uh, I'm going to leave that there. I'm not going to touch the high speed stuff because you want to get the low speed stuff right first. Because um, there's different valving inside the car. The right rear, like I said, is pretty damn good. The left rear is pretty damn good. The right front is not that good. And uh, I did both at the same time whenever I was in the, the sim. So I increased that a little bit so hopefully they're not all that bad um, let's take a quick look at the weight distribution going through some of these corners so let's look at it going through there 16 25 and 9 where are we as far as a thousand and twelve hundred so let's make sure that those numbers are correct in the background. So we got a thousand up front. And though they are not right. Twelve hundreds in the back. Not twelve thousand. Okay. Close that out and let's see what we got here. 15, 4, 8, and 1,083. Okay, so I don't want to go too much further than that for the simple reason as far as spring changes because, number one, you can't soften the front springs up too much because we're already darty um, on entry. And if you soften the springs up, it actually adds oversteer on entry. So I don't want to do that anymore. Um, what we may be seeing there has to do with aerodynamics. The rear of the car isn't being pushed down because we don't have a lot of rear arrow dialed into the car yet. So that may be that. So let's go out. I'm going to do this last run and then we're going to call it a day. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to know that we're coming back to a little bit of dampers and then we're going to start dialing some arrow and see if we can dial out some of this instability on entry.
Now here's something else that's running through my head right now. The initial outlaps are pretty good and they get progressively crappier as you go along. So remember how I said 22 PSI would seem to be pretty good and then going all the way up to 24 wasn't good? We may end up with overinflated tires after about two or three laps. So we may have pushed the car right out of the optimal hot tire pressure. So, like I said, the setup process is circular. We may revisit the tire pressures. I said in another tutorial at some point, and I'm starting to talk, so that means I'm going to screw up the bus stop, so just wait for it. Um, I said in another tutorial how important dampers are to a race car. You can see that right now. I went from eight to 10 on the low speed compressions up front. And we gained two tenths. I screwed up the bus stop. I knew I was gonna do it. But uh, so we lost two tenths through the bus stop. Yeah, we're losing a lot of grip as the run goes on, and that ain't good. So we may take the, the tire pressures from 24, the cool tire pressures from 24 down to 23, and see how that works. See, I got to talking. Happens every time. And then we're in the back. You were doing really good for that. But that actually, the little escapade through the infield, or through the grass, how bumpy it was, that's high speed damping. That's the stuff that the high speed damping is tuned, is used to tune.
Or another potential problem is there is no downforce on the back, so I may be sliding the rear ends around, the rear tires, which is getting them hotter and just making the car a lot more slick. So as you can see, as you start getting into the more details of the setup, you start really focusing in on some of the smaller things that have large influences on uh, the handling of the car. So, And I said this yesterday, and I'll try and reiterate this as much as I possibly can for, the, for people who are under the impression that setting a car up is difficult um, and that it's time consuming. It is to a certain point, but don't take these tutorial videos as a indication of how long it actually takes. It takes much longer to explain something than it does to actually do it. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you are um, running through the process. You know, so whenever I say, you know, we're looking for a setup package and I'm stepping you through it, yeah, it may take an hour, but it doesn't really take an hour if I was doing this by myself. And then after you learn a new car and you know what it kind of likes, you can just hop right to that package and you can go from there. So it takes even less time. But as you can see, we've gone from mid 44s down to 42s and we haven't gotten down to the detail stuff yet that's going to give us another second somewhere in there and then compounding on that is once you get a car that you're comfortable with and you and you feel good attacking the racetrack and attacking the course then you're going to build even more time. You know, you're going to get comfortable with it. And then, as I was saying yesterday, your brain is going to adapt to the strengths and the weaknesses of the, of the setup. And then you're going to be able to even squeeze more out of the, out of the car. Like, if this was the setup and I had to run the 24 hours tonight, I would be changing my braking points going into turn one so that I could maximize the uh, the car potential going through turn one instead of blowing it every single time. I'm pushing the car because I want to know what the weakness is so I know where to go and to start adjusting. Okay, so I'm going to be a little more conservative going through the bus stop here. Slow down to go fast. So like I said, that's, that's a good example of what I mean is as you get used to the to the setup of the car you can actually adjust it and I gained a quarter of a second just off of that so you know all that little stuff adds up so the car feels better save it okay so let's go and take a real quick look at MoTeC and see how these histograms shapes changed so there you saw we were pretty heavy on the on the rebound side of the fronts, the rears. Excuse me, we were pretty good. Takes forever to load this up.
And remember, go into if it takes starts taking forever, go into your documents and your um, telemetry file under iRacing in my documents, and you'll see like you can add like I'll go in there here. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you. Five hundred fourteen items, okay, that are that are in this in that folder. So five hundred fourteen items that this Motec program has to go through. All right, so we've improved it a tad. You can see um, twenty eight, twenty three, twenty seven, twenty four, twenty eight, twenty three, twenty six, twenty five. Um, the left front isn't responding as much as good as the right front but we're moving in the right direction. The rears are even a little more balanced than the front is. So as you can see, um, we're making a little bit of progress. So we know that I can be more aggressive on the left front um, compression, low speed compression settings. I can dial that in a little more and maybe take out a little bit of rebound at this point in time, a low speed rebound and um, do that and then tomorrow we can start setting up with the uh, with the arrow okay and we're going to start dialing in some rear arrow start pushing the car down that will probably give us a lot more stability uh, don't want to go too crazy because this is Daytona with, the, with a lot of wide open throttle time so we don't want to mess around with that so um, that's going to be it for today come back tomorrow or check the channel again um, for part 3 and uh, we'll make sure that, that we try and squeeze a little more time out of here or out of the car, all right? So, um, again, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope you guys are learning a little bit. Any suggestions, any comments, any feedback, please let me know. You can PM me through iRacing. Um, my name, Scott Volster, is my iRacing name. Or you can send me a message through um, the comments or the YouTube channel or something along those lines or, or whatever. Um, Feel free to to do that. Um, like I said, a constructive criticism, I'll welcome it. Uh, so I hope to see you guys on track. I hope this guy. I hope this all helped you help you out a little bit, give you a little more understanding about setups, and maybe it's not as scary as it was before. So again, thanks for watching, and make sure you all subscribe. And you guys have a great day. See you on the.